real treat for you next uh, in the form of Mark Barabo, our next speaker. Uh, so for many of you, Mark needs no introduction. He's a, a regular speaker here at Think Tank, and uh, our relationship with Jenison has been one of our longest and most successful. Uh, so without fur further ado, take it away, Mark. Um, okay, well, we're going to kind of move our presentation into three quick parts. I'm going to talk quickly about a, just a broad market overview because it's been um, a, a really negative environment for growth stocks, which is what we do for your portfolio. Um, but that's sort of turned the corner by the end of May, and, and we think we're back on a solid path, and we'll talk about reasons why. And then some of the structural areas of the market we really like going forward. Um, and, I, and instead of making it very broad-based, I'm just going to focus on a few because I think it's more interesting and I think they're going to have a big impact, uh, more importantly. And then we'll just review the portfolio quickly so you can get a flavor for where we're invested, how we've performed, unfortunately, in the last year. Um, uh, you notice that's page 26, so I'm, I'm trying to bury that. Uh, so, but, but I'll cover it, don't worry. Um, so, quick market overview, you know, uh, gross stocks really tumbled over the la year to date. It actually started at the end of November last year. Um, so, if you look at the blue bars on this, on this page, this is since 1997, we kind of break the market into quintiles of growth. And typically that top quintile, then the second quintile, which is more like stable growers. They're still double-digit growers, but more stable, like an LVMH, that kind of name, uh, maybe a drug company. Um, those top two quintiles really perform exceptionally well over time. Uh, and in fact, when you look decompose market returns, they account for most of the market's absolute return over time. So it's really important to focus there, we think, and that's why we love that area as a shopping ground. Um, but you can see over the last um, uh, year to date period, the green, everything flipped on its head. The slow growers, that bottom decile, performed the best. Uh, the faster the growth, the worse it performed, obviously because of valuation. So we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but these types of patterns don't last for long. You're going to revert back to fundamentals, and the market's going to come back to names that are really putting up outstanding numbers, particularly in a troubled environment. So um, anyway, the, we kind of got flipped up upside down this year, um, but our history shows that doesn't tend to last very long. Um, one of the things that's going to happen to the market this year and next year is earnings growth is going to dramatically slow. Obviously, coming off that post-pandemic V-shaped recovery around the world, you had a surge in earnings growth. Um, we all know what's going on in the markets today. You have uh, uh, monetary policy tightening cycles around the world outside of China. Um, maybe Brazil is at the peak of their tightening cycle, which is good news there. Um, but inflation pressures and other things have, 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 have really crimped earnings growth so far this year. So we're in for a, a, a more normalized period of earnings growth in the market. That's going to tend to benefit growth stocks. Um, growth multiples have been hammered this year. So you can see uh, growth relative to value, and we're using the S&P 500 because the U.S. market tends to be dominated by growth companies, so it's a good measure, but this happened around the world, as you saw in that first chart. Um, uh, so it didn't really matter which market you were in. You, 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 you were hit by the same compression and multiple. Um, we're down uh, uh, way below uh, long-term historical averages on growth relative to value. So that drop by a third in multiples has, has really been uh, felt considerably. Uh, we certainly took out the COVID premium. So why did growth stocks do so well in 2020 into 2021? Uh, because those companies were sailing through the pandemic, putting up strong results because they're in technology, e-commerce, et cetera. They were able to deliver goods and services, whereas the rest of the market struggled. That premium is long gone. In fact, it's at a, a big discount to where the market was back in 2019 or 18. So we think the reset has happened. 
Um, the other important thing to remember is growth stocks tend to do well during tightening cycles for the very reason you would think. Um, as, as interest rates go up, the economy is going to slow, earnings growth is going to slow. Companies that have secular growth behind them tend to do better as companies, and they tend to do better as stocks. And you can see that in the, in the blue bar uh, versus the green bar, which is value. And again, the reason we think we've worked our way through most of this is the, your portfolio and, and growth stocks in general have, have performed well since the end of May. So that, that giant reset, we think, is largely behind us for these reasons. So what are the areas that we're focused on? I'm going to talk about three major regions. You know, we don't do regional investing. We do bottoms up. But, you know, if you decompose the portfolios, these are the three big areas we're in. But we're not diversified within those areas. They're highly concentrated in a few pockets. Um, so number one in the U.S., you know, not surprisingly, it's technology centric in terms of our positioning. Um, uh, we, that's where the valuation reset was the worst. But we think also that's where the opportunity now is getting better. And, and our exposure in that part of the market is starting to go back up, uh, which is a good thing, I think, looking forward. In Europe, most of our exposure is in, in luxury. Um, it's in consumer companies that have a direct-to-consumer model in most of their markets. Uh, it's either through their e-commerce engine or through their boutique stores. So they control their inventory, they control the customer engagement, um, and their consumers are less impacted by economic woes. But most importantly, their supply chains are immune to problems because most of it's made locally. Um, and there's a reason these companies aren't missing numbers and having problems uh, in this market environment. It's because things are running very smoothly from them from an operational perspective and demand trends are very robust. We can talk about why, but it has to do with younger consumers just on a cultural basis moving to luxury. The majority of sales for Louis Vuitton or Hermes uh, or Chanel, it doesn't matter, Dior, the majority of sales are to people or millennials or Gen Z. Um, around the world. It's not just uh, in the U.S. or China, but around the world. So um, it's, it's not um, old people like me. It's, it's, uh, it's the young crowd really likes the products. But most importantly, the business models are built to succeed in this type of environment that's randomly been thrown at them. That's why the execution is, is robust as well as management foresight. And then in emerging markets, usually again, in a tightening cycle, it can be rough going because currencies can come under a lot of pressure vis-a-vis -vis the dollar, uh, which has happened. Uh, there's a lot of instability in the markets, uh, but our focus is on innovative companies in emerging markets. It's not on slow growth companies. And we think they stand a chance of really performing well from here particularly in, in big areas like fintech, financial technology, where you're seeing a massive structural shift based on disruption, moving away from traditional financial services companies, which have underserved those markets, into technology platforms, which are seizing that opportunity at lower fee and easier access. That's all because of the development of the mobile internet and the smartphone, that's what's enabling that migration. Um, Okay, in technology, the biggest trend today is the move to cloud-based computing. This is not new, but it's actually not slowing down. Despite all the turbulence this year, the big cloud providers like Amazon's AWS, Microsoft Azure, Google Cloud, are all showing robust growth rates, um, in some cases acceleration, and they're already growing at 30 to 40% a year. And these are big, I mean, it's uh, hundreds of billions of dollars of money that's moving from on-premise enterprise computing to the cloud so, so it's cheaper, easier to maintain, um, and the security is better. Uh, and so this migration, we think, has years to go. Uh, but so far this year, it's been very robust. So it's one of the areas we're, we're heavily positioned in because again, it, that's where the money is flowing. That's where the capital spending is going. 
that's where businesses are prioritizing their IT spending budgets. Uh, so we like it. The negative about it is it's enterprise. It's not consumer, which we prefer usually, like an Apple, um, because consumers are, you know, there's, there's millions and millions of us spending money. Uh, that's a better market than a, a CFO saying yay or nay to, you know, a $20 million project. So uh, we prefer the consumer side of technology, but we can't fight this trend. The enterprise side is where most of the new money is flowing. The other area of applied technology that's booming is digital payments. We've talked about this in the past, but it's really uh, um, booming this year as well as last. And you can see it's a consistent double-digit grower. That's the total bar chart here. Uh, these are transactions that are occurring uh, on a purely digital basis, either through e-commerce or now increasingly point of sale. Um, and that gray part is the fastest growing part, and that's point of sale. That can be from you using your phone instead of uh, an Oyster card to get on the subway or to pay for anything um, on a contactless basis. It's, it's booming around the world. And to put you know, some uh, flesh on it, one of the biggest winners from this is Audien. It's a Netherlands-based company. Uh, they've, they built their company from scratch to be digitally native. So they're not going through a transition or doing acquisitions, bolting on multiple forms of technology that are hard to put together. This is a pure scalable model and they're winning in the global marketplace. Uh, they're growing their sales about 60% a year. And a big part of that growth lately has been unified commerce. What does unified commerce mean? That's if you're a Nike, or if you're a McDonald's, or if you're an H&M, which are customers of theirs. Uh, it doesn't matter if you and I buy something online, order it online, pick it up in the store, have it delivered. It all happens on a unified payments platform where they can identify us, the, the customer, and they can seamlessly track that purchase securely, without fraud, um, and with better acceptance rates so that you, the customer, don't get turned down artificially. And they're winning with this unified commerce platform. And, it, and companies that don't have this are going to lose big in the marketplace. So um, that's why they're winning so much market share. Um, if you look at where penetration of digital payments is the biggest, you, know, you can see here, you got some big mature markets like the US, 89%, the UK, 89%, China's at 88%. Um, but Audien is winning in the developed markets in a very mature market by having a best-in-class solution. So they're gaining a ton of market share. So that's one way to win. The problem is there's only one Audien. <laughs> there's not two or three. Um, and so the bigger shopping area for us, so the bigger pot of gold, is in the rest of the market where you have low penetration, particularly in emerging markets, ex-China. China's very sophisticated in digital payments, it's owned by Alibaba and Tencent, uh, but the rest of the world's wide open, and that's where we see great opportunity. The other thing that's happening is not just digital transactions in emerging markets, but access to tr traditional financial products like credit. Huge opportunity um, in markets like Mexico, Brazil, Argentina, um, and, and we're heavily invested in this area because Using digital technologies or platforms, you don't build out a banking system or a banking network with branches. You offer it on a mobile phone and all of your banking is done on a digital device. And it's far more, uh, it's growing far more aggressively uh, than traditional services. The, also is, the opportunities are also big in Southeast Asia, depending on the market. Some are highly penetrated, like Thailand. Other big, much bigger markets, like Indonesia, very low penetration. New Bank is one of the examples of a, of a company we're investing in, which is one of these new breed of fintech companies that's providing credit in Latin America and growing rapidly. Uh, here you can see their user growth. It took years for adoption to gradually grow, and then it hit that S-curve, what we call that S-curve of adoption, where it becomes viral. And today they have over 60 million users 
in Latin America. It is the largest um, digital bank in the world, and it will become even bigger in Latin America over the next several years because they're attacking big markets now like Mexico, um, which is going to be a, a great opportunity for them. So uh, these are some examples of where in emerging markets you're seeing access, financial inclusion, really driving entrepreneurs' um, a vision about how they can penetrate that market and take it from a system that just re doesn't really serve those customers or serves them at very high price. So this disruption is a really important one, one of our, our favorite areas. Okay, let's move to the big one though, that's gonna move hundreds of billions of dollars of market cap over the next five to 10 years, and that's electric vehicles. Um, uh, you can see uh, penetration rates by the end of 2021 are pretty low in most markets. Uh, we use Norway as our golden child of uh, where the world is moving. Uh, Norway, lead. <laughs> Norway leads, what can we say? Um, and uh, electric vehicles, um, you know, in China, by the 2021, we're about 13% of the market in the U.S., less than five. Um, Europe's a little bit stronger than that. The big markets like Netherlands or Germany are, 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 have higher penetration, but they're still way below 20%. But what's gonna happen is this. So you saw in the previous chart that Norway was you know, over 50, but actually in the first half of the year, it's now almost, uh, it's, it's broached 70%, it's almost, it's approaching 80. This is one of the interesting things about disruptive products. It usually takes 18 to 20 years um, or 15 to 20 years to reach 80% penetration. So when the Model T was invented, um, it only took 18 years for the U.S. to have 80% penetration of vehicles. Uh, you know, that's a lot of horses that put out to pasture, so to speak. Um, but it only took that short period of time. For television, the same thing. Radio, the same thing. Uh, tele telephony took longer, it was a bigger CapEx spend. But wireless, of course, was much faster because you already knew the use case. So for electric vehicles, we would expect, if, if Norway hit it in year 12, um, we would expect the rest of the world to follow pretty quickly. And so by 2030 to 2035, somewhere in that time period, 80% of all vehicle sales in the world will be electric. Um, that's important for profitability uh, because electric vehicles are dramatically more profitable than combustion engine. Um, and if you look at Tesla on the right side, their free cash flow per vehicle uh, in 2021 was almost $4,500 per unit, dramatically higher than BMW in the luxury end of the market, but, and of course, hugely more profitable than mass market. So, you know, EVs just have a structurally better profit component to them. That's why uh, uh, Tesla generates more profits uh, than anyone else. Um, and part of it is the business model's better other than the components cost less. Uh, so the old model, you have dealers, you have uh, repair shops, you have gas stations, you have an insurance company. Um, with the new pure EV model, first of all, you have software, which is more valuable than any of that other stuff. Tesla's just started an insurance business because it can track your driving every second, which they do. Um, uh, and they know if you're a good driver or not, and they can offer you insurance at a better rate. They're not guessing, they actually have your data. The charging platform, uh, they can charge for that. Uh, so they, there's no gas station. You go pull up and do a Tesla supercharger. The repairs, the company does, but there are very few repairs in an electric vehicle. Maintenance is close to zero. So in fact, it's not a big dollar thing, but for you as a consumer, it's a huge cost saving. Um, and then the vehicle purchase is done online. You only buy Tesla online, you don't go through a dealer. So they keep that 6% margin for themselves. 
So what you're witnessing is this huge transformation, not just of the industry, because consumers want electric, it's better. It's better performance, it's cheaper to operate, and it's, it, it's cheaper to maintain. Uh, and it's green, at least in their view, who knows where the electricity is generated. Um, but uh, it, it, it's compelling for the vehicle manufacturer, if you have the right model. Um, okay, in the US so far this first half of this year, obviously it's winner take all here. Tesla dominates the market, including that's the Model Y and the Model 3. And then here's the Tesla Model S and X. So, you know, that's, uh, that's over 250,000 vehicles. Obviously the next competitor is at 20. So it, it's not even close. Um, in Europe, they also dominate, but they have more competition uh, because Europe doesn't demand as high range vehicles. They're lower range, not as efficient. Um, but in the, in their, they, they don't, you know, per mile or, kilo or kilometer driven, they're not as good. But it doesn't matter because you don't need the range. Uh, so there's more competition in Europe, but Tesla still dominates. And their dominance is going to grow over the next year because of their Berlin factory. Um, and then in China, they also dominate. And most importantly, because it's at the high end, they do have BYD as a competitor. And if you add up all of BYD's models on this chart, which there are many, there's one there, 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 they actually are bigger than Tesla in the first half of the year, just slightly. We expect that to continue, but they're mass market. Um, and, and Tesla's profitability is, is double that of BYD's. Uh, so you, again, most of the profits are gonna be earned in the, in the premium end of the market. So the, the transformation of the industry is being driven by the disruptor, the company coming from nowhere and redefining what the auto industry model should look like and redefining the consumer experience. This is a classic disruption like we saw in personal computing, like we saw in the smartphone. Uh, it's nothing different than that. Um, and, and so the playbook is pretty clear to us. <laughs> you play the leader, the disruptor, until the market is saturated. Um, and, and so there's a long window of growth here. Uh, and we think, it's, we think it's quite compelling. And this is gonna be the single biggest industry transformation or disruption in the marketplace for the next decade. Um, I'm gonna skip healthcare for the moment just in time because I wanna leave time for Q&A. I told you I would get uh, to this page, unfortunately. So uh, trailing one year, um, and I believe this is as of the end of uh, uh, July. No, it's the end of June. Um, you know, down, down 35%, way below the market return, which is 15.8. So it, that was quite a bear market for growth stocks. Um, you know, on a three, five, seven, ten 10 year since inception with momentum, the numbers uh, look very strong, but that, that was quite a hit. Uh, something we haven't seen since, uh, really since 2001. Um, uh, it, 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 very out, outstanding negative result there. Um, when you look at the winners over the last year, it's pretty slim pickings here. Um, so that's on the left side of the page. Uh, you know, Tesla's number one. Then you have Novo Nordisk and Eli Lilly and treatment of diabetes and obesity. Those are gonna be big market opportunities for both companies for the next few years. They both have new products coming to market, which are gonna be, we think, significant, multi-billion dollar opportunities. So we like both of those companies. You see some technology companies like NVIDIA or Apple, um, and then, uh, uh, you know, biotech like Argenix. Ferrari, uh, you know, the lone luxury winner over the last 12 months there. Um, importantly, where there's a dash is, those are stocks we didn't own. So seven of our top 15 winners last year were things we didn't own. That's not saying much, um, that were catastrophes in the market. And then where the damage was on the right side was really in, 
either emerging markets or developed market e-commerce related technology platforms or e-commerce companies such as C-Limited or Mercado Libre, Shopify. Um, it was in uh, other technology enablers like Airbnb or Roblox, et cetera. Um, it, it was really in the, I would call it more in the emerging growth category. Uh, so the more uh, aggressive part of the portfolio was hit the hardest. Now of this list, um, seven of the 15 are still in the portfolio because we don't, while they perform poorly, we don't think there's anything wrong with the business. In fact, they've beaten numbers consistently. It's just the valuation got marked down. But since their fundamentals are pretty robust, we're, we're going to ride through the rest of this storm with them. We think that's really the prudent thing to do. The others were sold just because the business um, benefited too much from the pandemic and it was not sustainable. Um, it, it really couldn't have the legs to grow uh, off of that base. I mean, it might take a few years um, to absorb all of that pull forward of demand. Um, so that's kind of the nutshell in terms of the winners and losers. Not a pretty picture uh, over the last year. In terms of where we've been active, uh, it, by sector, I guess there's only one major thing going on here. So if you look at the far left, you can see communication services coming down in weight over four quarters, and in the middle, healthcare coming up and kind of absorbing it. That's the only major shift in the portfolio. The communication services really is internet, and, and so it happened in two phases. The first phase was we exited China very aggressively beginning last January, I mean, a year ago, January, and there was very little left in the portfolio um, uh, over the last four quarters. So that big drawdown, um, which was important because in 2021, China did implode on the internet side and we, we actually added 100 basis points of excess return last year in China. So it was really important we made that move. Um, the rest is just taking profits in some of the big ad spending platforms which, which benefited, which we've now just reduced in size. Nothing other, nothing dramatic. And in healthcare, just taking it up because you do have some product cycles that are interesting uh, coming in biotech and pharma, which we want to take advantage of. And then we have the tools companies that are enabling these innovations to really uh, flourish. Uh, and so demand is quite strong there. It's also not cyclical. It's not impacted by interest rates. It's not impacted by inflation. It's not impacted by the economy. So we figure it's a pr pretty good place to be uh, for a while because the economies are going to slow and we need some protection in there. Other than that, not much is going on. You can see tech weights starting to come back up. We're just taking advantage of those depressed valuations we saw um, at, in, in May. Uh, and, you know, but you can see historically, we're probably not going to go a lot higher than that weight. Uh, but there's, there's always going to be opportunities to maneuver there. By region, uh, I guess the only interesting thing I would say is emerging markets is, is single digit, eight, nine percent. The last few quarters, that's kind of a bare minimum for us. We're, we're just kind of sitting there in, in those fintech um, dynamos that I highlighted. We really like them. But it, 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 EM is still pretty dicey right now. But, you know, for those companies, it's OK. And the valuations look really good. Uh, so we're hanging out, but at very low exposure for us on a historical basis. China's, you know, very low in terms of exposure because it's China and we th we're not in the internet at all. We're just in some healthcare and BYD and electric vehicles. We think the internet's over for China um, uh, in terms of investability because of the government. Uh, and then Europe at 44, trust me, we're not bulls on Europe. Um, it just... These are global companies that happen to be headquartered here. They're doing really well. We're there. We're bottoms up oriented. We're not regional. Um, uh, but I get that question a lot. <laughs> Why do you love Europe? We, we don't. We, 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 but we love some companies in here a lot. Uh, and there's great opportunity right now. And I'll say for growth stocks in particular, Europe is, is, is cheap. Um, it usually isn't. But for growth companies, it, it's actually has some really good ones that are pretty attractively valued right now. 
Um, these are our top 10. Uh, uh, I'd be happy, and I'll end the, the presentation there and open it up to Q&A. Um, and, and hopefully we have a pretty good dialogue.